this. And in fact, I'm going to I'm going to do this is an example of a sewing machine needle. The various parts. The shank is the part that actually goes up in the sewing machine. The shaft is actually this full length here. Some sewing machine needles have a groove along the back. There is an eye, there is a point, and actually here, there is a little cutout, which on, let's see, there we go. On this image, let's see, it doesn't want to, there we go. On this image, it gives you a better, they call the scarf. Um, obviously, the shank is what gets twisted into the sewing machine to hold it in place. The shaft is just the link to make it so that it can actually reach down to where the, um, where the fabric is. The scarf on that, on this needle, and the groove that is only on some needles, some needles don't have it, are actually kind of the two of the, the most important parts of a sewing machine needle being a sewing machine needle, in that this is what actually makes it um, notably different besides the obvious. The obvious is the eye is near the tip instead of near the back. Um, but what's unique about sewing machine needle is that that cutout in the back, the scarf, is what captures the bobbin thread so that when the thread actually goes down the needle and through the eye and, it, and goes underneath to catch, uh, to, to make that lock stitch, that's how the actual stitch is made. So the groove is on, and apologies for being slightly out of order. Uh, the groove on the back of the needle is an additional help to keep the thread moving smoothly down the needle to the eye, which is why some usually nicer, slightly more expensive needles have a groove. Some of the cheaper needles don't necessarily have a groove. Um, this is the standard hand sewing needle. I'm sure everybody knows has an eye, it has a shaft, it has a tip. There are no grooves necessary because the thread only interacts with the needle at the eye. Um, there's no scarf necessary because again, there's only one piece of thread or at least sometimes you can use more than one piece of thread, but you are using a single line of thread, whether you use one or more strands um, and it only interacts with the eye. I will not go into the whole thing about why and how they decided that the eye was going to be down there and how they switched over to using a lock stitch instead of a chain stitch. You can look that up yourself. Um, but the eye on a hand sewing needle and a machine sewing needle, exactly the same thing. Similarly, um, because they are exactly the same thing, some hand sewing needles will have different size eyes. Some um, the, you know, every hand sewing needle will have a unique size eye. And similarly, the eye on your machine sewing needles may be differently sized. These, these change less often than the hand sewing needle um, because there's a lot more assistance in being able to make this actually go to where it's supposed to be versus a hand sewing needle. I'll show you another image in just a minute so it shows a number of the different options for uh, the eyes of the needle. Uh, and the other part that is similar between a hand sewing needle and a machine sewing needle that changes depending on type of needle is the tip. I'm going to here. And this is where this comes in. So here they are trying, they are showing it based on the idea of, um, of the machine needle. But please know that hand sewing needles have similar um, options in that there is a difference in the sharp pointed needle, a rounded point needle, and actually this is a Joyzy ballpoint needle. Um, this is leaning towards what in hand stitching would be um, more chenille. Um, and if you go really, really blunt, tapestry needle. Um, so you kind of go super sharp point, less sharp, 
and then even less sharp to the point that we don't have to worry about it uh, snagging on the fabric. The sharper the needle, it's denim one or the Microtex, uh, the sharper the needle, the more likely um, you are to have it stab in a small area, um, which is great in some situations um, on fabrics that don't stretch because it just forces the threads aside. And even if you snag on a single piece of thread, uh, it will force the fibers of the thread aside and just let you keep moving. As I'm sure if you've been sewing for any period of time, you have heard stretch fabrics require a different needle, generally one that's slightly duller because unlike fabrics that do not have elasticated fibers in them, uh, if you try to poke through the thread on a stretch fiber, it will stretch and then it will snag. It will either change, you know, pull the fabric and end up with the thread not laying flat or it will rip and then the other threads will adjust to accommodate it uh, and you'll have an issue with that. Now, down here, they show self-threading needles. I personally don't love self-threading needles. Um, I never purchased them for my sewing machine. And though uh, they're more common in hand sewing, it's the same setup with the hand sewing needle, except obviously the eye of the hand sewing needle is at the top instead of at the bottom. So the self-sewing, self-threading hand sewing needle has an eye at the top that has an opening on the side. Uh, it does make threading the needle faster, but it also means that you have an open cut in your thread in your needle that every time you go to use the needle in your fabric, it can catch on your fabric and tear your fabric. And I have purchased a set of self-threading needles and I have had them break on the fabric when I try to use them. I have had them tear at the fabric when I try to use them. I have had them cause the thread to break when I try to use them. So though they do make threading the needle a lot easier, if there's any way you can figure out how to thread the needle without a self-threading um, needle, I recommend doing that. Now, I didn't go over these other ones because what in, sewing machine needles or microtex or sharp is literally just a thinner needle with a very sharp point. What they call universal here is just average level of thickness with a relatively sharp point. Um, when you have uh, sewing machine needles and hand needles, you will find that they have, um, they have differences at each part of the needle. Here, you'll see the eye of this needle is bigger than the eye in the previous picture I show you with this hand needle. This makes threading the needle a lot easier. It also means that when you pull the needle through the fabric, it will press the fibers apart more. Similarly, um, needles, I'm not saying the various names of the types of needles because Though they all have names, some of the names end up overlapping and depending on where you like where you get your information from, some people will say you need this kind of needle for this kind of sewing or this kind of needle for the same kind of sewing or the same needle for multiple different types of sewing. And if you look at it from the perspective of what is it going to do to the fabric and what is it going to do to my thread and how is it going to make my sewing flow, then you'll end up finding the needle you want a little bit better. So whether it's hand sewing needles, which is what I'm showing here, or a machine sewn needle, you want to look at how big is the eye, because the smaller the eye, the harder it is to um, thread, but also the less it's going to affect your sewing. The bigger the eye, easier to thread, and the thicker um, thread you can use in the needle. Uh, the shaft thickness, is the thickness of whatever wire they use to make your needle out of. Again, 
how wide does it press out, you know, how wide does it press out your uh, the fibers of your fabric and um, in what shape, which I'll get to in just a minute. Again, the point I mentioned the sharp versus a fully blunt, really sharp needles. If you are using a fabric that you don't have to worry about a snag on the fiber, um, pulling the fiber and stretching it out of shape uh, can be really good because you're you're going to be able to get through those holes between the fibers a little bit better. But if you have a fiber that has some stretch in it, having uh, a needle that's a little bit blunter gives you that opportunity to to sew quickly without having to worry, whether it's hand stitching or machine stitching, to sew quickly without having to worry about it tearing up your fabric. Similarly, um, the brain freeze. That means I need to give you guys a second to ask questions if you have any. Feel free to tell me if you have questions. If you don't. If everything's good, give me a thumbs up. If you have questions, I'm good. Okay, I'm gonna go with things are good. All right, so. Um, A sharp point, great for fabrics that, you know, straight woven, non-stretch. Uh, the duller points, better for stretch fabrics. Uh, there's also what are called tapestry needles, which is the ultimate in dull points. You could literally stab your hand with it and it's not going to do anything, um, which is used for tapestry. So like weaving tapestry is also used for weaving ends when you're sewing or uh, excuse me, when you're knitting or crocheting or any of the rest of that. Um, it's also good for if you have to weave in the ends of the thread after you hand sew. There aren't really tapestry sewing machine needles. Um, you get blunt enough that it's a tapestry needle. The sewing machine isn't going to be able to do anything with it, uh, but it's always going to be handy. But like if you have a serger, you try to sew it to, to hide the threads of your sewing. Um, good for that. Uh, also, if you have something, uh, and there are like big, thick ones and smaller ones that are dull enough to be tapestry needles. Um, but if you have something where you're trying to embellish, that's good. If you are embroidering and you have uh, a very loose weave fabric, the blunter tip, whether you go all the way to a tapestry style because you have like a really open weave, cross stitch type fabric, or even if you have an open weave um, linen, let's say, you can use a blunter tip needle because you don't need the sharpness of the needle to get between the threads of the fibers. So uh, when you are looking for needles, you want to look at how sharp is it? How thick is the shaft? How big is the eye? Um, the numbers, I should have pulled up a picture for that as well. Uh, long story short, the bigger the number, the thicker the needle. Mostly, at least on hand sewing needles. Give me a second to think it over with uh, machine sewing needles because that's something that was important that I apparently forgot in the last one. Um, there's also uh, a couple of different types of unique needles. Um, things like uh, wing wing tip needles, which if you look at the sides of these needles, these are sewing machine wing tip needles. So there are hand sewing wing tip needles. Um, they'll probably a lot harder to find. They have an actual extra ridge of metal here that pushes the fibers even further aside. So they make a visible hole in the fabric. And those are often used for decorative stitching. I mean, you can use it for decorative seam stitching, but it's to be done in on fabrics when you want there to be an obvious, notable hole with the thread going through it. Uh, and there are uh, no. Hold on one second. Uh, there are there are um, needles for 
multiple different types of um, hand sewing, some that have curved tips, so the needle is straight, but where the tip is, it actually is at an angle to make it easier to sew. Um, there are curved needles. Most of these weird needles are used for uh, leather. And I'm trying to show, uh, here we go, uh, for hand sewing um, and machine sewing leather, there are also uh, different needles. And if you look at the actual, the actual hole that is created, they actually create a different type of hole, which is a lot, which allows or causes the thread to go through the leather in a different way, which means that the stitches actually end up looking different. And uh, some of them actually hold onto the leather better, but you are going to want to talk to somebody who knows way more about leather to hear about which, which shape is better for which type of stitch. But this is true both in, these are, these are uh, for sewing machines, but even for hand sewing on leather, different actual shapes of the tip are um, important when it comes to that kind of sewing. Uh, I will mention there are, um, there are not usually different shapes to hand sewing needles for sewing fabric. I mean, you can sew with a needle that has a weird shape, but 99 out of 100 sewing machine, uh, excuse me, hand sewing needles and sewing machine needles for fabric are rounded. It's going to be sharp to blunt, but the tip is going to be round. Um, there might be a slightly oval shape versus a fully round shape, but you're, that's what you're doing. Um, also, you can have Hand, I mean, sewing machine needles tend to be about the same length. Obviously, they go on a machine, you need uniformity, um, that's the thing. Hand sewing needles can be anywhere from like an inch, inch and a half, to I have an upholstery needle that is 12 inches long. Um, it is all whatever is most useful for you. I personally believe that when you are hand sewing and you are doing um, you are doing seam type stitches, longer stitches, stitches that are hold, supposed to hold together well, um, and stitches that are either forward or backward stitches. I, I, I personally think there are only two to three actually different types of stitches, forward stitches, like running stitches and zigzag stitches, where every stitch goes forward past the previous one. And then back stitches, half back stitches, stitches that kind of crisscross over itself. So you have that. And then there's a couple of stitches where you literally have to go back and forth and up and down to make a single stitch. And it's a really convoluted thing. Uh, but 99% of stitches, if you're just going straight forward or straight back and there, you know, or straight forward and to the side, because it's a zigzag, you know, then a stitch that's about, you know, say two inches long is usually good stitch. You don't want the shortest needle possible because then you literally have to regrip the needle after every time you take your stitch. But you don't want a super long stitch uh, needle, like say three inches or something, um, which is, you know, still a relatively common, I guess two and a half, three inches uh, is a relatively common hand sewing needle size, because then you get the needle into the fabric far enough that when you take it out, you have to pull before you're free of the fabric. So something that allows for whatever your sewing style is, for you to do two or three stitches, maybe four, and then regrip the needle, or um, some people like to stitch and kind of bunch the fabric up, but when they grab it, it almost immediately slides out. That's the length you want for again, normal seam stitches, um, because that allows you to get through whatever work you're doing more quickly. More complicated stitches, still a forward stitch or a backward stitch, but slightly more complicated stitch, like a catch stitch, where 
even if you think you're going really fast, you're going to have to grip and regrip because you are crossing over yourself or you're going, you know, in multiple directions when you make these stitches. Um, and I personally think um, a lot of embroidery actually does really good with short needles because you are already going to have to uh, like adjust how you're holding the needle a lot. So you're not losing out on any efficiency by the fact that the needle is super short so that, you know, you can change directions really easily because it's super short. You can um, catch really small amounts of fabric because they're usually very thin as well. Uh, so those are you know, really great um, for that. But especially when it comes to hand sewing, it's mostly about how it feels in your hand. Uh, so I won't. Like I gave some direction, but I don't want to say this is like, these are all absolutes because uh, it's what works best for you. Uh, so that is all the stuff that I have in mind that I didn't forget. I probably forgot some stuff, but all the stuff that I can remember right now for sewing needles. Besides, this is an embroidery needle. This is a sharp. This is a chenille. You can find that anywhere. Um, is there anything that you were hoping to hear about needles? that I didn't mention or that you have questions on or anything else. No, I don't have any questions. I mean, I thought, I, to me, this is fascinating because, you know, I, I sew a little bit here and there and um, I had no idea. <laughs> I thought there was just one needle for the machine. So um, this was very informative. Oh, and that, that reminds me. Thank you, sorry. Uh, that does remind me. A lot of people, when they start showing, sewing, do not realize that the common direction is change your sewing needle. Every new project, when you're talking about working on a machine, and it's not really like every new project, but it's like up to eight to 12 hours of active sewing. So you might be sewing for a full day, but you're not actually sitting at the machine for eight hours, you know, but like after eight to 12 hours of active sewing, the sharpness of the needle is like not as sharp. It's dulled. Um, there could be nicks. It's been rubbing against uh, the fibers. It's been hitting against the pieces of the bobbin case and the rest of the thing. And, you know, it's been jerked around and like stuff can happen. Even I have a needle that I pulled out and did not even notice until it was out that it was bent to the side because I... I think I was sewing and I was like, oh shoot, this is wrong. Hold on, let me stop it and let me move it over a couple of bits because I want it to be on a different line in the fabric. And it was down in the fabric and I like I held my fabric and it, instead of it sliding, I don't know. And it just, the fabric bent it to the side. So now the needle still sewed to the rest of, you know, whatever I was using it for, but it wasn't sewing straight anymore because the fabric literally bent the needle because things in, you know, so. I don't think you necessarily have to change your needle after every project, but you should change your needle more than just like when your needle won't work for you anymore because your projects actually come out less nice if you don't start with the sharp enough needle. You know, some, again, there's still the, the spread between extra sharp and totally dull, but if your needle is supposed to be a certain level of sharpness and it's not, the stitches actually come out worse. Okay, so in terms of thread, this is what people usually think about when they think about, oh, all the kinds of thread. There's all these different fibers and they look different and they act different. And that is absolutely true. Also, you can buy cotton fiber and have crappy um, thread and you can buy cotton fiber and have really high quality thread. You can buy polyester and have like horrible thread that will melt every time you try and iron your fabric. And you can buy polyester that's gonna be like extremely high end and hold everything together and you have no problem with it. The fiber matters, but there are so many other things about thread that also matter that I kind of put it to the side. Um, I will say uh, synthetic fibers are generally stronger than natural fibers. Just hand for hand because they are synthetic. They don't have to deal with the realities of nature 
and being fibers. You know, polyester, technically a fiber, but it's plastic. It's just long strands of plastic and it will hold together but better than a bunch of separate strands of wool. Also, um, uh, synthetic fibers don't have to deal with the, uh, the issues with, uh, that are natural. Like wool uh, does felt. So if you sew something and you use a, well, a wool thing, okay, if you sew wool on wool, the thread will become a part of the, fa the fabric. Once you wash it, like they start to kind of become one. If you want that, it's great. But if you sew it and then you like steam and then you're like, wait, why is it hard for me to unpick this because I sewed it in the wrong place? Because you use wool on wool. You use wool on linen, but you now have this weird fuzzy thing that like really smooth and sleek when you sewed it in, but now it doesn't match. You know, th those things I'm sure you could figure out if you think about it at any, at any length. Um, I will also say natural fibers, including silk, no matter what lies they tell you, can take heat a lot better than synthetic fibers. So if you have a, a fabric that you know can take heat and that you intend on using heat on, especially cotton and linen, not necessarily wool, but again, I, people make, make commentary about how silk is so sensitive. Silk is actually a very strong fiber. It can take heat and it can take water. Now, the finishes on silk can't always take heat and can't always take water. But that is why you test your fabrics before you sew. Um, but again, keep that in mind because if you sew something made out of cotton or silk or wool and you use polyester fabric, uh, uh, polyester rayon or nylon or any of the others um, as the thread you're sewing it together with, and then you iron it on the temperature setting that's good for your fabric, you might melt your thread. So that is something to keep in mind. It's a balancing act, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what to do, but those are things to keep in mind. Uh, similarly, uh, there aren't necessarily a lot of finishes that you really need to worry about with synthetic fiber fibers because they're synthetic. Whether or not a uh, thing is bonded, if you deal with some synthetics, you, you know, you might have an druid thing connected with synthetics, but most of these are related to um, actual natural fibers or semi-natural fibers uh, around uh, where the fibers do a thing and maybe you want it to do a slightly different thing, like mercerizing cotton to, to make it a little bit shinier and a little bit stronger. Glazing uh, linen to make it a little bit stronger. Uh, fire retardants. I hate fire retardants, but you know, obviously to keep it from burning. Uh, so things to keep in mind, things that will be mentioned if they exist. Like if, if you have a thread that has this, this has been done to it, they'll advertise that because it costs money. So they're going to tell you they did it. Um, it can change the way the fiber interacts with your uh, fabric uh, and it can change how you can sew with it. Uh, but hopefully you don't buy a fiber you've never used with a finish you've never used and use it on a big expensive project that you hope to be um, you know, wearing or carrying without testing it. Please test your stuff. Uh, I can't pretend that I know everything about all of these or any of the others that exist. So I'm not going to go super deep into it, but please note that they do exist. Um, I will also mention um, there are often, uh, there are a number of five, uh, threads that are waxed. Now, like you can buy waxed linen thread. Um, and those are ten, those tend to be so that the fibers will lay smooth and hold together better. And sometimes it helps with the sewing so that it will slide through the fabric better. But it is waxed. And that means that the wax can get onto your fabric and it can stain your fabric. There are um, also like beeswax and other things that you can run over your thread, even if they're not already waxed 
to give the same effect. But again, it can get on your fabric and it can stain your fabric. Similarly, if you are using a sewing machine because you can't, you know, beeswax your, an entire roll of thread to use in your sewing machine, there are um, there are sewing machine oils for thread to go through the sewing machine. Read up on those. Use those at your own risk because you're putting something into your machine that's going to affect both the machine and the thread. Um, but it can make the fabric, the fiber, flow more smoothly through the machine and get into your um, your project a little bit more smoothly. But again, anytime you are adding something that is wax or oil or whatever, you are adding that and it can possibly stain your fabric. So you wanna test these things. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say take the wax and rub it on the fabric and see what happens or take the oil and dip it on the fabric. But like, if you want to wax your thread or if you want to oil the thread going through the sewing machine, get a small piece, you know, try the oil, the thread oil the, on the thread and test the thing and then say, oh, is this going to be okay? Give it a little bit of time to see if things settle in before um, before you work on the larger project. Yeah. Then the next thing that most people think about is how thick is the fabric. You can visually see the difference in thickness of fabric, but these are a number of ways to count the thickness of fabric. Uh, oh, excuse me, of threads. Um, I think denier is the one that a lot of people have heard uh, because if you ever bought or know of anyone who bought nylons, you will hear denier. Um, the weight of the fabric is like, uh, excuse me, the weight of the thread, just like weight of fabric is based on, um, how much you need to get to a kilogram, it's a whole thing. Uh, so honestly, unless you intend on buying your stuff by the kilo, you're never gonna, like it's not gonna get into your mind deeply enough that you're gonna just be able to easily go, oh yeah, I need a X you know, kilo thread. Um, but note that these are all different ways to uh, I'm going to, the text thing is similarly, text is a certain number of uh, meters of thread per uh, per gram. Again, one, one, one thousand, right, of the weight number. Uh, yeah. Uh, and if you look, it's one thousand meters versus however many kilometers, whereas it's a gram versus a kilo, which is a thousand grams. So those are equal, you know, equal to each other, depending, but you know, a thousand times either way, bigger or smaller. Um, but again, unless you're buying your thread in bulk on a regular basis, you're not gonna notice it. It's gonna be something, I mean, you're not gonna be able to just go, oh yes, I know exactly which one I need. But as you use the same thread over and over again, you might come to recognize, oh, I often use, you know, 200 denier thread or 50 text thread or whatever. Um, and then you can kind of build up that knowledge. Uh, I tend to go with the idea of, you think about the thickness of thread in terms of how strong you need the hole to be um, if you are doing seams and how visible you want the thread to be, period. Um, so like embroidery floss, which is a type of thread, I'll just cut it up short, um, is going to be thicker than a sewing thread, which is going to be thicker than a serger thread or an embroidery machine thread, uh, because the holds you want or need out of those things are gonna be different and the visibility is gonna be different. And embroidery floss is actually going to hold better than a sewing machine thread, a regular average sewing machine thread, but it's going to be so visible and affect the thickness of your stitches so much that it's not worth it for the thickness. Whereas you have the serger, the thread is much narrower, but you don't need it to have as much strength as a sewing machine thread 
because you have at least three, if not four threads holding those various pieces together. So whether you are sewing it by hand or sewing it by machine, um, the thickness matters both in how strong it is, if you're dealing with seams or anything where there might be any pressure and visibility. You also want to keep in mind if you are hand sewing, the thinner the thread is, the more likely you are to end up with knots. So if you are hand sewing, when you have really thin thread, you want shorter length. The standard um, rule is if you are sewing, you want your thread length to go from hand to elbow. I tend to cheat that by going from hand to elbow twice. Well, no, hand to elbow and then like nearly elbow and having it, having my needle at the halfway point. I like that because when you're hand sewing, you are putting pressure every time you pull the thread through the fabric on that point where the thread connects to the needle. And if you have it folded over, as the thread gets mixed, gets you know sewn into the fabric, you pull the needle further along so that stress is in different points so that you don't get you know halfway through what you're doing only to have it break because the stress has just been over and over again. Um, also, when you are hand sewing, as we said, the thicker, the, the bigger the eye of the needle, the thicker the thread you can use. You have to take into consideration, is the thread I'm planning to use too thick for the needle that I need to use to make these stitches nicely. If I use this thread and this needle, am I going to put pressure on the fibers of the thread so much every time I put the thread through the fabric that it ends up breaking early? Or on the other hand, is the thread so small that when I try to do the stitch, I, you know, I have this big needle because I wanted to make a hole and blah, 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 blah. And then you find the thread keeps wanting to slide out because, oh, it's super easy to thread this hole, but now it's super easy for the thread to come out the hole too. Um, so those are those things. Um, and finally, the thing that I think very few people think about when it comes to thread is the twist. Um, now, please note, most most thread, most commercially made sewing thread is an S twist thread with two or three, um, actually I think three, not, with three ply. Now, um, traditional handmade thread tended to have a Z twist. S twist means it twists to the right. Z twist means it twists to the left, um, which matters when you are hand sewing. It actually affects things. When you're machine sewing, you're going to be using commercial thread. It's going to be an S twist. You never have to question it. Um, but when you are hand sewing, it actually does change things, especially because if you pay attention, the more you sew, the more the thread starts to kind of roll up on itself. And if you if you sew at any length, you will notice that the twist will tend to always twist in the same direction and you go to untwist it and it will always untwist the same way. Um, and that's because the twist of the thread is this S twist on most fibers. Um, the ply is how many individual strands of fiber are brought together to make the thread. It is more common that if you need more than three or four ply, you are not actually going to have um, separate strands where you just got a five strand thread that's S twisted. It's more likely you're going to have something like this where they create a core of threads and surround those core of threads in some way and then use those as the individual strands that are then plied together. Um, there are also um, threads. I don't think this is a great example of what they mean when they say, oh, no, this is corded. Um, but there, there are also threads that are um, cord threads where instead of 
each ply having its own core and being plied together. You have a single core in the middle, and then the various strands of thread or, or fiber are wound around it to make the, the ply. So a lot of um, metallic threads, those the cheap plastic ones that are shiny like metal, they will have a core of like polyester, and then they will have uh, essentially tinsel wrapped and plied around it. So the thread looks like a regular plied thread, but it actually has a core of polyester in the middle because that tinsel is just weak enough that it would never hold to sew. Um, and so if you ever see, if you ever see a thread that talks about being a, a core spun thread, thread with core, um, that's what they're saying. It's not just single strands of fiber that are twisted together. There is a core of some sort, either a core in each strand or a core surrounded by the strands of fiber to make the thread. That matters, especially if you are hand sewing because a plied thread can untwist if you do something really wrong. But a cord thread, especially one where there's a center core surrounded by other fibers, they untwist really easy because the core is what's taking the pressure when you sew. When you pull the thread through, that's what's taking the pressure. And when you let go, the outer threads kind of release, whereas the inner one still holds on some pressure, which is why if you ever try to use those um, metallic threads that are the, the tinsel borax ones, you'll find that you have to be very careful and cut actually shorter lengths so that you don't accidentally end up with like shredded thread as you try to sew with it. Um, and then I, I have personally never used a corded thread, but that's literally just, here's a couple of different threads and then they've been twisted together. Uh, this suggests that they tend to be S twisted for the individual threads and then Z twisted when they are put together. I'm not necessarily going to say that's true. I have dealt with a number of different ropes um, that are, again, that are corded like this. And if you make uh, piping or do any patissement, whatever, um, you might end up dealing with cord, and I can't tell you whether the X, the outside version is going to be S-twisted or Z-twisted. But if you were to untwist it, you'll find that the separate pieces are twisted in the opposite direction. Uh, so that's that about the thread. Um, there's probably more to know if you might have any questions. Okay. Uh, this was a lot. It's been recorded. Um, but I will also say, uh, I did not actually go over everything, just went over the things that I could remember after rushing home from the doctor's office. So please, if there's something else that you uh, want to know, feel free to ask at any time, both, you know, now or in the Discord, which is going to be posted. Um, 